Thanks. Well, I'd like to thank Danko for inviting me here. And I've already heard some complaints about the language. Computing for free, free is not a noun, but it's like in modern ads. It's not actually quite for free, so I think the title is appropriate nevertheless. I'll start with this ad things first. We know that Moore has said a lot of things. First, everything should double within a year, then two years, and then other change that to 18 months. And he accepted that, and let us see how it goes today with some aspects of his law. The speed, the clock speed, and we see first it turned from exponential to linear, and now it's constant for already four years. So, and uh, not due to Intel, but to IBM. So it is already that. What's proposed instead of this exponential law is the following clusters all around. So not only in big halls with all that heating, but also in our laptops and desktops. So recently this slogan appeared in the Intel Journal. And what we are now left with is to increase exponentially the number of our PCs instead of increasing the speed of the processors. So that is becoming a problem and recently the Congress asked for a report and the report was issued and this thing doesn't include cooling and maintenance so when you and it also doesn't include private PCs and laptops and so on. So when you include first of all the clusters that are not servers, not Google and so on, but just scientific clusters. Then you see about how huge this heat dissipation now is. And the question is, should we add the new parallel law, which was also found by the committee appointed by the Congress, to the already old Moore law of doubling the CPU heat each 18 months. And that's the only aspect in which the Moore law improved. So it is now the fact that the CPU dissipation doubles each 12 months, not each 18 months. When we add all the cooling, maintenance, so on to the servers and clusters, then we actually get 2.5 of the overall consumption of the electricity. So why does the CPUs heat up at all today when we know that we don't have any more this Feynman heating. At the beginning, the transistors were P and N transistors with the resistance of a heat dissipation. Now we have got CMOS without the resistance, but we have got the parasitic capacitance. When we switch to one, so we use the P component, then we develop the static charges in the N component and vice versa. Anytime you send electrons through the whole system, you actually dissipate the heat, which is equivalent to this amount for each transistor in which you change the state. So can we eliminate heat dissipation? It's the first question and that's that part of the computing for free. So it's not completely for free but I'm just looking for whatever calculation so either changing of states in qubits in quantum computation or electrons in devices we shall call reversible computers. So the answer is yes, we can eliminate it so as to slow down the processor completely and do it like in the LC circuits by just swinging the electrons from capacitor to a coil and back and in the middle somewhere we have got the transistors that do not offer a resistance. So when do we have to do that really? Actually not now because now we can't help much the dissipation of the heat until we reduce the number of electrons in the circuits to about one purely economically. We can do it now but no one would accept it seriously except perhaps in mobile devices. The critical thing which I would like to consider now is this one electron per bit in classical computers limit and then I would connect it to the quantum computation. But actually we can apply everything to the classical computation and what I'm going to say for one electron per bit also now if we just don't want to dissipate this 
capacitance energy in a slowly swinging processor. So when we go to one electron per bit limit, we reason about like this. We look at the ideal system of a gas and the entropy that would correspond to the heat and that would correspond to the work done in an ideal gas is given here. So for just one atom or just one electron, let us assume the following scenario. We have got a Maxwell demon who puts a wall as soon as he observes the atom in the left part of the whole compartment. And with that, he establishes the state of this bit of calculation. So now, let us say, it has got a value 1, because it's in the left compartment. In the right compartment, it would have a value of 0. What happens next? When you want to get out the result, or you want to calculate something else, you have to erase that one bit. As soon as you just want to record it, you erase it. Your calculation is finished. At some point, we have to have some work done. And the demon removes the piston on the wall in between the two parts of the compartment and it raises one. The entropy increases of the environment and we have got the Landauer principle that the entropy is given by this amount per atom per bit. Of course we can have more atoms and then we'll have the famous Boltzmann entropy. You know then that's the epitaph on the Boltzmann's grave in Vienna where we have got the entropy for just a number of possible states which is actually the entropy that's ascribed to information transferred in a process of computation. So the unavoidable part of any computation, no matter how low we go, is this part of erasing bits of information. And now we come to the point how to do the computation without erasing the information, without dissipating the heat. We can do it in two ways, classical, by reversible computers, and quantum, which is reversible by definition. So let us see first what we don't have in this scenario, the standard binary solution, we see that in the gates we just dissipate by definition the information because from two zeros we get zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. So we cannot go backwards because for three zeros we have got three different inputs. Essentially we just here erase information, we erase bits as soon as we do any computational operation. So to avoid heat dissipation, thou shalt not erase bits. How we can do that? A simple C naught gate, not Feynman, it's just Toffoli, because Feynman, we'll see that later, received the inspiration for his proposal for quantum computers from the reversible computers that were developed several years before. So as we can see, we can, in a control gate, or control control gate, remember all the bits when we do some operation. So we just change end structure, everything else remains the same. You can imagine that like a symmetric matrix in which all diagonal elements up to the last two are the same, once on the diagonal and the two last uh, ones off the diagonal. Control not and control control not gates we can use to define all the standard operations that we have got in the normal calculation, so and or and so on, and we can have everything reversible. What that means? That means that during the computation we can keep the electron going through the gate and have it back without spending any energy for this flow. But of course, that's what I said at the beginning, it's a little bit part of advertising. We do have to spend some energy on switching, otherwise we wouldn't be able to do any calculation at all. If we look at two concatenated CC0 gates, we see that we get out the same what we put in on the other side. So they are reversible. Here are some examples for how to get standard operations. So end operation or O operation means that we have to put variables that are coming into end operation in the first two control levels and zero in the third and we'll get this output that means end operation out in the third one and the first and the second out levels of the gate would serve us keep track of the input states of the bits and recover them later on. Here the simulation is a little bit more complicated. We need two more CC0 or C0 gates to convert first these inputs to their negatives, but all in all the CC0 gate is universal and there are several thousand universal gates in reversible computing. That means we can express all of them 
by any other. That part for which we have to spend the energy, the switching part, we don't have resistance and we don't have dissipation in the flow, but we have to do any calculation whatsoever only by switching electrons on the paths. We do it in that way. This is the C0 and this is the CC0 gate. Quantum computation is very similar. The, the main idea that Feynman put forward is still valid today, to, to use the control gates to just carry out the computation and we can use various Fourier transforms to obtain the final result. But I'll speak about energy only. So I'll try to see what we can do for free in quantum computer as well. Some things we can, some we cannot. But this, we, what we can, are interesting fundamentally because I'm going to explore how we can do some manipulation of quantum systems without transferring any energy to them using some other principles. For the time being, we'll just say that qubits are two level states of quantum systems systems spin up and spin down or polarization horizontal vertical or left and right and these things can compute but the important thing first of all is that we cannot measure them in the course of the computing we have to remember the states but not that we know the state but that the every next gate knows the state but we will never know it will only learn the result in the end because as soon as we know the state we destroy the computing so we have to find way to feed the next stages of the computing with superpositions and entanglements and we never know the ratio of which one or the other state of a qubit takes part in them. That's one aspect. The other aspect is we cannot clone, we cannot copy qubit, so we have to be careful to keep them alive one by one. I mean a single qubit is essential for computation until the end of the computation. So qubits should somehow survive and remain in a coherent state. So we we shouldn't disturb them too much and that's all about whether we transfer and energy to them or not. If we don't, they've got better chances to survive. This is about how we use the energy. Of course, we'll use some energy for laser beams and keeping the whole system working, but I'm looking at the other aspects of the energy spent. As I said at the beginning, the reversibility is inherent and it's here due to unitary operators that we use for quantum computation. By definition, all the operations are reversible. When Feynman proposed his quantum gates and computation, he had, first of all, this reversibility in mind. So controlling qubits means transferring energy, and that means decohering them. That's an old stuff, and since Weinmann and Elitzo said it could be useful, then I had a second look at that. They said some six years afterwards that could be useful, and I realized it could be useful for quantum computation as well. So it's a simple resonator. We can also imagine that as a Fabry Perot one. We've got highly asymmetrical mirrors instead of 100% one. So we've got two possibilities. Either we'll have beam going left and right or not. So if we can establish the interference between left and right one, then we'll have in the end destructive interference at the input and constructive at the output and the photon would go straight through. If we cannot establish interference, then the photon will bounce back immediately. And we have got the similar thing here. If photon can go round and establish an interference, then it will go straight through. If cannot, it will bounce back. Uh, practically in the old lasers, if you put the hand in and you just kill the beam. But what's interesting here is that we operate with one photon only. So it's interesting that if we don't have anything inside or if we do have something inside and we suddenly switch a beam and we still don't have a photon, photon will know whether it should bounce or not. If we have got something in the path and if we suddenly switch on the beam which doesn't contain any photon, it will know it has to bounce. It will not go in. So that's a conceptual problem. How it knows it cannot go in. Now, let us apply that to quantum computation. Let us take rubidium atom and it has got a hyperfine structure and zim and sublevels. And what's important for excitation and de excitation of electrons, we have to use the circular polarized photons and the same things applied for the emission. Instead of first exciting and then de exciting the atoms, we can simultaneously excite and de excite them, stimulate it around 
Hamilton transition. So we have got to transfer from one state to another without any continuous emission. This stir up process then is not observable in a classical way. We don't have a simultaneous emission which we could detect and we have to somehow see whether the operation succeeded or not. And it means we have to probe whether this level is occupied or not, whether here we have got an electron or not. And we can do it in an interaction free way. Left circular polarized photon see the atom because it can excite it. So the cross section of the atom is much bigger and figuratively speaking the atom is much bigger itself for uh, a beam tuned to the frequency which is able to excite a particular state in the atom. So to see means a bigger cross section with which a photon can interact. The point here is that we don't have a photon. We just have our empty beam within a resonator. So we can induce a change of the atom from G1 to G2 by a stereo process, as I said. Then we can convert the left and right circular polarization to and the linear polarization. And then we get this state notation. So qubit for us is the whole atom, but actually only two states of the atom that we handle, and that are these G1 and G2 states that we have seen previously. So these are the control states, and the atom is actually controlling the photons, and the states of the photons are given here. So the photons are our target qubits, and now we have got the resonator with the loop. So if the atom is in the state G1, it cannot absorb the photon in the zero state. It it means the one will see the atom and the zero will not see the atom. So the, the photon in the zero state will just go through and it will, so to say, charge the resonator and go at the other side of the resonator out. The photon that can see the atom will bounce immediately here and it will go this way. And the other way around is for G2 state, so the other photon will see it and will go through. So we have got two states in each of the atom states and that means we have got four possible photon states. And that's not only if effective in non-disturbing the atom states. It's also the first probing of that kind in the sense of having all four photons survive. Because with the direct real photons, this thing here just ended up with the absorption of the photons which we probed. So we had to conclude on the states of the photon based on non-detecting the photon, which is not reliable for computation. How can we now combine the two things, quantum and classical reversible? But only classical reversible computation has got compatible gates which we can reverse and recently all optical reversible gates were found so we can apply them to those photons that are outside of the system and reuse them and have a full-fledged device so this previous device is not just a device for checking whether we have got atoms in the right state but the part of the computation now the fundamental foundational things we look at the superposition we can use the stereo process to see simultaneously produce the transition to two different levels using cavity which is substituting laser beams and it means we don't know in which of the levels the electron is so we have got a superposition it is undistinguishable and this photon coming out which is emitted in the end can inform us on the superposition we obtain now we can apply the interaction free beams to these two levels and then we have got the following situation here we have to have these both levels unoccupied and if we probe this one with one of the interaction free beams we know that an electron is here or is not here so we cannot have a superposition and if we keep this active it will never go to this one with at the same time occupying the other level that means that we can manipulate the state without transferring any energy to it perhaps that's not obvious enough in this example but let us look at the following example we have got atoms in a trap and we let them to a double slit and this double slit will then produce the interference fringes so we have got most of the atoms here or here and here but practically no one in between as soon as we know of the path so well have egg, we will not have the interference fringes so we'll change the destination of the atom without transferring any energy whatsoever to the atom so we'll change the position and the path of the atoms for free so that means without an energy we get some state and the question is whether we can have some other examples when we get one thing without filtering it on that property and the answer is yes we can entangle a spin without spin for example we can find out that these two photons are entangled in spin 
although we didn't use these filters here to get this spin entanglement, and we don't have to have this beam splitter, we can just detect these two photons in any detectors in the space. So it's not the mixing which is important. What's important is simultaneous detection of these two photons and we'll get them correlated in spin although we didn't use any spin filtering and that means that we can do teleportation better than we did it so far because we can teleport spin without here detecting any spin we just have to detect two photons nothing else and that means that because of Goran's reaction I have to finish anyhow there are no more slides so that's the last one